This is the DallasCowboys.com Draft Show. Your war room for insider news and draft analysis from deep within the confines of Cowboys headquarters at the Star in Frisco. It is... What is today? Tuesday, February 20th, 2024, and we are 65 days away from the NFL Are you draft. confident about that? I am, I am confident about 65. that. 65. 65 days away from the NFL draft in Detroit, Michigan. See, I got it right. There, there we go. go. Boom. It was still loading on my my, my screen. Good but stuff, Kyle. 65 days away, and we're wel- welcoming you into the draft show presented by Miller Lite. Alongside Nick Harris, Zach Wolchuk, I'm Kyle Yeomans. A little bit of a lighter crew today. No Aisha, no Bobby, no Brian this week. But we will uh, possibly have Aisha back on Thursday. And then uh, we will keep on rolling with Bobby and Brian as well. Chris Beam in the back. There is a couple weeks here. And we talked about this a little bit on Talking Cowboys earlier, Zach. But this is just the lull of the offseason because there's no free agency. Yeah. There's no combine yet. There's no numbers to go off of. It's just basically conversation week Mm -hmm. before we go to Indy next week. But there's not a whole lot going on, but it's a chance for everybody to start watching a lot of film, right? It sure is. Uh, we we can all get caught up if you uh, you know during the Super Bowl week, like we were out there in Vegas, is uh, our station with 105 through the fans. So n- now is a really good time to dive in right before the combine. We're going to get a lot of no- new information for the combine yeah. as well. I think some of the most fun is just what's going on with the Bears. You know, you've got all the rumors with the trade possibilities with the number one overall pick. Do they yeah. want to maintain stuff with their quarterback? I feel like much like last year uh, with the Bears moving that pick to Carolina, they are kind of controlling every. Everything with the draft. Is it a division rival that ends up going ahead and swapping from two to get up to one, which could be scary depending on how you feel about Caleb Williams. But I do think some of the trade draft scenarios now are where things start to get a little juicy and fun as we start to see some of these mock drafts come out and all these trade possibilities really, uh, I think, are catching my eye. Yeah, gosh, if you're if you're thinking about Chicago here and they, they trade back to two, let's say yeah. Washington trades up to one, they could still trade back and pick up more they stuff could. from from there. So yeah, they really have the world. They're in a the great palm of their spot. Hands. Yeah, they have the world in the palm of their hands going into this draft. I think it's a really good point. I think a lot of the things that we're still kind of answering questions with as far as the draft goes and, and the 65 days before we uh, we get there is what Chicago will do, and I think there will be a huge trickle down effect uh, as part of that. So we'll just kind of see these next few weeks go on. I think combine is going to be a really Really, really important time for mm-hmm. um, uh, the Chicago front office to get with some get with some people and see what what offers they like for both the number one overall pick and Justin Fields, or if they decide to bring both of them in and, and kind of go from there. Which I, I would be shocked if that happens, but according to reports out of Chicago, it's not out of the realm of possibilities. So. All thing in Atlanta is interesting. I mean, you know, they're in the business for a quarterback there as well, and and where they're sitting in the first round, do they are they a team that wants to move up? Do they want to get into conversations there with Justin Fields? Are they looking to try and move from eight? Uh, up into that top three. And I think the Cowboys, and I know Brian has mentioned this as well, at 24 in the back end of that first round, I mean, depending on how many of these quarterbacks go off the board, I mean, I think there's a lot of teams that do like Michael Penix Jr. And you're starting to see J.J. McCarthy go pretty high in some of these mocks, which, look, I mean, I talked about it last week. I don't necessarily view J.J. McCarthy as one of those guys, but other teams do. They look at his skill set and say, hey, that can be one of our uh, organizational foundational pieces there uh, at quarterback. But at 24, Cowboys might be in a good position where there's a team that wants to move up, that didn't end up getting their quarterback. Yep. They want to get that fifth-year off option and then you can move back and try and acquire some extra picks so that could be a sweet spot there at 24 we've talked about this a couple times already the scenarios that could play out whenever you are trading away and you're trying to pick up selections in a draft where you don't have a fourth round pick fifth round pick sixth round pick Mm -hmm. before the comps come in later in the process but I, i think it's very likely that you could get there now if the right players there at 24 and they sit in that draft room up there, and they, they're sitting in the war room, and they're having these conversations. They're saying, this guy can help us win football games right now. I think all of a sudden you're taking the guy, and you're not worrying about it moving forward because you've got a head coach that's on a one-year deal that's got to win now. But if you're saying, hey, there's there's three or four picks down the road that we could maybe get to at 28, 29, 30 that could still help us win now, mm-hmm. and you can pick up a second round and a third round player that you could play at some point down the line as well, I think you make that move. I wanted to ask the question, though, because you guys brought it up. What are you doing if you're the Chicago Bears at one? Are you trading the pick or are you taking the quarterback first, whoever it may be, 
and Drake uh, Drake May. I mean, Caleb Williams is yeah. the obvious favorite. It's easy for me. I, well, I'm, I'm taking Caleb Williams. Yeah, I am too. You, I'm yeah, because I, I think, and, and I wonder your thoughts on this, Nick, but I, I'm resetting You know, my rookie contract scale. Exactly. I, th- I think you've seen, and I think Justin Fields has potential, a uh, sure. change of scenery. I don't think Justin Fields is a bad player. Health has been an issue there. He has not had a lot to work with. He's had constant turnover at offensive coordinator. They've tried to rebuild that offensive line. He finally got a good receiver this past year yeah. with DJ Moore, and I thought he played some of his best football towards the back half. So I can see another team like the Atlanta Atlanta Falcons maybe wanting to say, hey, we're not in the top three. We're not going to get one of these guys. We'll trade for a Justin Fields. Maybe it's their top pick in the second round. But I'm taking Caleb Williams. I think he is just that much more of a prospect. Can, better you, get prospect. A, can you get a first round pick for Justin Fields? I think so. You think you can get a one? I maybe think most likely a high like two. A top 10 one. Yeah. Uh, it, I don't think these teams, New England, Arizona, LA, New York, Tennessee, Atlanta, I don't think they're trading their pick this year. For Justin Fields like that. Yeah. I don't think they're doing that. But what you could see doing is maybe one of these teams later on in Indianapolis. Ah, they just drafted a quarterback. Probably a bad example. One of these other teams that doesn't have a quarterback that's in the later parts of the first round. Then you turn around and you say, hey, let's go get this guy and we can ship this off and all of a sudden you know what it could be is one of those scenarios where it ends up being a second rounder like maybe it is Atlanta's second round pick uh, 43 overall but what you can do is put stipulations in the trade much like we've seen with Calvin Ridley and that move that Atlanta did with Jacksonville where if they go ahead and re-sign him all of a sudden that moves up from a third to a second round pick if Atlanta makes the playoffs now it's a first round pick for next year or whatever it is I mean maybe there's there's types of language that you can put in the deal but I don't know that a team's just going to give a straight up one for Justin Fields right now. Yeah, I don't. I, I, Trey Lance. It's got a quarterback. A it's a starting quarterback. <laughs> I think a one is necessary. Uh, it, at least that's what yeah. I think Chicago would need. Yeah, I, I understand on. that. It really depends what team is what team is having that discussion with Chicago at the end of the day. You know, what team is so needy where they would give up a one? I think you look at Denver. You look at Vegas. Mm-hmm. Um, you look at the Saints. I think those are. And those guys, literally those teams, 12, 13, 14 in the first round. Um, maybe, gosh, I, I was thinking about Seattle, but I, I, if, if you're trading for Justin Fields and you're trading a one, you're expecting him to play this year, and, and Geno Smith is, is locked in there. So I, I don't know. It's it's going to be an interesting, an interesting decision for Chicago to make, but also any team that would be calling Chicago about Justin Fields uh, going into the fourth year of his rookie deal, um, a fifth year option, you know, still open to be exercised. So th- that's a, that's a, two-year quarterback rental basically before you'd have to make the decision on signing him long term or letting him walk and or would you be okay letting him walk if you gave up a first round pick so that's those are the questions you have to ask yourself if you're trying to trade for Justin Fields there but I, I again man Chicago's got all of the cards right in their hand all 52 and they're just showing I know they're showing everything they I'm got. a little envious you know it'd be fun yeah. right now to be uh, part of that bear, that Bears war room because that's the first time you can say that in a while it is because <laughs> yeah. I mean and, and they got a hit on it I mean trust me they, they're in a situation where if they end up uh, fumbling the bag on this you're gonna yeah. look back and say oh my goodness uh, GM gets fired over this. what is yeah absolutely people yeah. are gonna be losing their jobs yeah I was about to say when it's fun for us to talk about <laughs> that means it's probably not super Tough fun decisions. for them to talk A lot talk of about. sleepless nights. I do yeah. want to circle back as we talked about, you know, the trade back scenario at 24. And you said, like, OK, depending on who's on the board, you're right. I mean, th- there are certain players that you probably don't want to move off of. And as we've kind of looked at some of these mocks, and we get a feel for, like, realistically, the options of who could be there at 24 for the Cowboys. Yeah. Are, are, are there some names that you know, OK, depending on who's this team that's calling, whether it's Indy, whether it's Atlanta, I'm not moving off 24. I'm staying home and I'm taking that pick. Are you asking? Are you asking? Do you stay? You're you're staying at twenty four, like no matter what. Who, yeah, who would doing? be the players where you're staying at twenty four? I'm not trading back. Oh, okay, I see. Jackson, Jackson Powers, Powers Johnson, Johnson. <laughs> Oregon. Um, um, other than that, like I'm okay with kind of moving around. I think this tackle class is deep enough to where you can kind of take a gamble on moving back three or four spots. Okay. And if you lose out on a Jordan Morgan or a Tyler Guyton, you can still jump on a Kingsley Sulamataya or. Um, Goodness, I'm blanking off the top of my head right now. But the, there's really good tackles that you could still take in that late first round, early second round type of range. Um, it, it, Patrick Paul, I, I've talked about him a few times. Troy Fountainot uh, out of Washington. So that, that's that's another one. Mary Smith from Georgia. We brought him up. Can we talk about Fountainot a little bit out of yeah. Washington? I don't know if we've hit on him specifically. I saw him mocked to the Cowboys in one specific yeah. mock draft okay. earlier this week. But anything there? I mean... It goes back to what you're talking about. The depth of this tackle class is significant. So if you don't 
get the Amer the Marius Mims early on. You don't get the 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 Morgans or the Tyler Guytons. You could make something happen. Why is Fontenot up there as a potential as well? Yeah, I think you look at um, and uh, between Fontenot and Fatanu, so I'm going to go Fontenot here. Uh, I think I've said Fatanu in past shows. We'll just kind of go show by show basis on that. <laughs> um, he's got some guard flex. Yeah. He's got some. He, he's shorter, shorter wingspan, um, but really violent in, in in how he plays guys in a close range. And so you see that and what he was able to do at Washington in that in that area. And you want him playing in that phone booth at the next level. That's what some scouts are looking at. So he. He has that guard flex that you could possibly slide him inside, and you could be comfortable doing that. Where that kind of becomes tricky for the Cowboys is what do you do with Tyler Smith in mm -hmm. that instance? Do you push him out to tackle, or do you want Fountainville at tackle? I think that's something you play with whenever you have that guy in the building and you figure it out. I, I think if I'm making the pick in the first round, I don't. I'm getting a true tackle that can play at left tackle and can be super mobile, can be aggressive. Uh, there's no question about him being a left tackle. That's 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 me. But I also understand the case for wanting a guy with a guard flex so you can have a little bit more flexibility there as far as what you can do with Tyler Smith what you can do with this new kid and just kind of go from there but um, I, th I think Fountain definitely falls into that latter category as a guy who does have flex if the Cowboys pull the trigger on him then they're going to have a lot of work to do during training camp to figure out what his um, what his position is best at yeah I, I've got him as a guard I just think he's got that guard body yeah. type now I you're agree. absolutely right violent can plays through the whistle good body control strength uses his hands well like his punch gets to the second level can he play tackle I, I do think he could but I think he translates best to playing kicking inside and playing guard at the next level so if you're the Cowboys I'm looking at it I am moving Tyler Smith back outside the left tackle and I'd be playing him at left guard or maybe he ends up being a future right guard replacement if you wanted to move him over uh, for, for Zach Martin depending on how many years he wants to play there but I, I looked at him and just from my tape study because I mean he was listed at 6'2 I think uh, he ended up measuring in at 6'4 which was pretty good good yeah. uh, so I mean hey he's a little bit taller than I initially thought when you watch him just the, the way that he's built I just think he fits better inside of that guard spot but he's smart and, and he is a guy that you mentioned that flexibility if you have injuries across the line I do think he's capable of kicking outside and playing tackle I'm currently looking for his uh, pronunciation guide. Yeah. <laughs> it's not easy Washington didn't have it readily available but we'll get there initially but do you have anybody that you what is your short list of guys that you would stay at 24 for. Yeah, I mean, I don't think that uh, Fuaga is going to make it to you. They're at 24. Guys. Yes. But I would totally uh, stay in there. So realistically, I'm with you guys. On Jackson Powers Johnson, I do love Graham Barton. I know we got to look at the medicals. Graham Barton's a guy that I would yeah. probably stay in at 24, make that pick. If a light too lot too fell to you at 24, I think I'd have to consider that as well because I love him as a player similar to Jared Verse. Uh, otherwise, outside of that, like any of those tackles, I do like a bunch of these options, but I don't know that I would be, oh my gosh, I love Amarius Mims so much, or I've got to sit in here and take a Tyler Guyton, the offensive tackle out of Oklahoma. I think I would be willing to make that move back to acquire some extra ammo, depending on how far that slide is, especially if you can get a one for next year potentially thrown yeah. in. Uh, I think that's something that I would consider. So I think for me, it's really just one of those center prospects, whether it is Barton, Jackson, Powers, Johnson, or if you get one of those studs to slide to you like a Quinion Mitchell, the cornerback from Toledo, somebody that you're not expecting to be there, similar to a C.D. Lamb draft at 17 when you're on the board. You're like, how the hell is C.D. Lamb sitting here? Uh, those are probably the names that I would be interested in. The more that I kind of crack down this first round and what teams need and what they could potentially jump on, and this is pretty free agency, so there's still a lot that could play out in this, in this scenario, but you look at 17, 18, 19, 20 in the first round. Mm -hmm. You got Jacksonville 17, Cincinnati 18, Rams 19, Steelers 20. What do all four of those teams have in common? They need offensive line. Yeah. And you could make the case that all four of those need tackles as well. So you have to be able to be comfortable going into that first round, sticking at 24, understanding that there's probably going to be a run of offensive linemen Absolutely. Before, before you get there. And we've already talked about Miami's potential to jump on a guy like Jackson Powers Johnson. I think Jackson Powers Johnson could potentially go even earlier when you look at a team like Jacksonville that can make a move like that. Uh, but I, I think you, if you're comfortable with going into the to the draft knowing that that could happen, then that means you're also comfortable with trading back. So mm -hmm. um, you just kind of have to see as, as the uh, draft day shenanigans play out. I think we could have some, though. I think there's definitely a possibility to trade back. I think that should be in the in the minds of everybody. I think going back three, four spots and picking up a, an extra pick somewhere else where I think you really need it, I, I, I think it would be a great decision. Can something happen in free agency to shift that thinking to say – 
okay, we've done enough in free agency. Now it's more likely for Dallas to trade backwards. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I think if you, what would it take to get to that point? Uh, you get a starting caliber offensive lineman. Yeah, yeah. You go ahead and maybe you uh, you sign one of these centers uh, that's going to be available in free agency, or you make a trade for a guy. You know that you have Tyron Smith coming back, so you're a little bit more solidified. You feel better at left tackle as well. How do you feel if you re-sign the guys that you are putting on the free agency market? You get Tyler Biotish back, and you get Tyron Smith back. Is that going to stop you from drafting an offensive lineman in the first? It wouldn't stop me uh, because I think you know about the injury risk with Tyron. Correct. You know, when, when, yeah. So I think you need to upgrade and have a better contingency plan there than what you have it's currently. the right answer, Zach Wolchuk. So, yeah, I, I'm, I'm still and, – and I got into an argument with uh, some of the guys on the G-Bag Nation as well about this. It's like, no, because that's a one-year deal. Yep. And I don't care the, – the, the point is, okay, if you take a guy in the first round, you want him to play year one. That's great. You'd love that. But when you look back at the career, and if he doesn't pay a bu- play a bunch year one, and he will end up inevitably doing that because Tyron has not proven he can stay healthy throughout a full season, yep. the next four years that you get him, if he's your starting left tackle, are you going to look back and be like, man, we just didn't get uh, 10 games out of him year one as a rookie? No, you're not going to care if you got yourself a good player. So, no, none of that would stop me from drafting a lineman in the first round. I had a conversation with this with our great producer, Caden Gates, who does a lot of stuff behind the scenes for the Cowboys. He does a lot of stuff uh, on the TV side of things, and he listens to every draft show. So he will hear this, and I have no problem bringing this up, but it's a good conversation. He said, from Mike McCarthy's standpoint, is he okay making a selection knowing – that you, as uh, if you bring back Tyron Smith, you're not going to see your first round pick or any production out of your first round pick, except for a handful of games where Tyron Smith is out. Would he be okay doing that? And my answer back to him was, I, I think he would be, because it's not a normal situation. You expect Tyron Smith to to miss games. You expect him to miss time. Would you rather have a guy elsewhere that's having production? Sure, I'm sure that would be very much so welcome for Mike McCarthy. But you also have a contingency plan, so if Tyron Smith goes out, you're not automatically up a creek without a paddle. Absolutely. You've got that plan of somebody that where you can put something in there, someone in there, and confidently have your offensive line taken care of. Right. I mean, if you have better replacements in place in games like Arizona and Miami this year, do you win those football games? Mm-hmm. It's a fair question, yeah, right? Very so, much so. Uh, I think it matters. It matters for seeding. All of these games we've seen with the NFCs going down to some of the final weeks, the final game of the season, uh, I, I don't think that it would be a reason why I get it. Uh, it, it it's kind of a make or break type of season. Uh, I just want to take the best player. And, and I think offensive linemen, that's always a position that you can go ahead and hit and it's going to strengthen your football team. Yeah. And they've been really good at drafting off. Really good at it. They say, hey, this is a first-round lineman. We want to take him. I'm saying, hey, go ahead and do it. He's going to end up being an all-pro. Get after it. A guy from Tulsa, go ahead. Yeah, Yeah. do it. No question. (laughs) All right, when we come back here on the draft show, we're going to go into some Twitter on the 20. We've got some great questions we're going to be answering here over the next couple of minutes. If you haven't put your question in yet, go on Twitter or X, as they call it nowadays, at Kyle underscore Yeomans. It's my penultimate tweet on there, my next to last tweet there. So go and find it. Give us your questions. We'll answer them when we come back right after this. I'm Dak Prescott, quarterback of the Dallas Cowboys. And they snap it to Prescott, who looks right. It's not there. He escapes left. He'll run for a first down. Just like football, when it comes to crypto, it's important to have a team you can trust. With blockchain.com, I know I'm in good hands. Since 2011, they've been trusted by millions around the world to buy, sell, and trade cryptocurrency. Prescott's going to run this himself. Run it up the middle, and he scores. Whether you're new to crypto or an active trader, they've got you covered. What are you waiting for? Get started at blockchain.com. I'm Darren Woodson, former Dallas Cowboy player and Super Bowl champion. When I played in the NFL at a high level, I relied on my vision to see the field. As I started getting older, I noticed my vision wasn't as good, and I was getting frustrated from wearing my glasses all day. I went to Laser Care Eye Center and Dr. G talked about all the options. Thanks to technology and Laser Care Eye Center, I can see near, far, and between. Don't fumble your vision any longer. Visit them at dfweyes.com and tell them Darren sent you. 
They got me back on my game. In a stressful world, Lincoln provides balance and calm amidst the chaos by creating sanctuaries that move you through the world with ease. Our vehicles make your time richer and more uplifting with human-centric design, intelligent technology, and powerful performance. As the official luxury vehicle of the Dallas Cowboys, driving a Lincoln is just another way to show your team pride. Experience our full lineup of luxury vehicles, including the Corsair, Aviator, Navigator, and Nautilus at Lincoln.com. Hi, I'm Danny McRae, Dallas Cowboys alumni player here with Smoothie King. And Smoothie King wants to ask you, what's that sound? That's the sound of us magically transforming our smoothie bowls into two new decadent flavors. Dig into a cool acai or pitaya bowl handcrafted with crunchy, purely Elizabeth granola, fresh strawberries, and finished with a velvety chocolate hazelnut drizzle. Perfect for breakfast, lunch, or anytime you want to munch. And that's the sound of you making them disappear. Smoothie Bowls, now in two new decadent flavors. Only at Smoothie King, the official smoothie of the Dallas Cowboys. This is the DallasCowboys.com Draft Show. Back here on the Draft Show, presented by Miller Lite, a taste you can depend on. We've got Zach Wolchuk, Nick Harris, I'm Kyle Yeomans, and in the back, Chris Beam, doing a great job as always. About to hit the button because it's time for some... Twitter, Twitter on the 20. 20, 20, 20. Twitter on the 20, as always. Gets even better and better every single week. Okay. Tom Downey, good friend of the show, says, who wins in a steel cage match among the draft show hosts? Go. Steel. I'm just kidding. This is not what we're going to talk about today. <laughs> <laughs> it would be pretty funny to talk about, but we've, we've got only a limited amount Beam. of time. Yeah, Chris Beam would win. There you go. All right. Anthony Gibbs says, if the Cowboys decided to re-sign Pollard to a team-friendly deal, which running back in this draft class would be the best compliment to Tony Pollard, in your opinion? I think we've had this conversation on this show before. Have we? Um, I, I, I think there's a couple of guys. I know the guy that you at. like a lot. Talking about me? Yeah. Who, 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 was he in the star this week? Bucky Irving. Yeah, that was, that was exactly what I was yeah. going to go with here. Uh, Bucky Irving, I think there's so much that you can do with him. and he, It would be the perfect transition period too i think if you were to bring back pollard on a one or two year deal bring in bucky irving and let him sit as the complimentary type guy for one or two seasons and it would not surprise me if by the end of those one or two seasons bucky irving is taking the majority of those snaps and being the being the feature guy there i think he's um i think he's going to be a player in this league for sure yeah i like uh, bucky irving i, I think that that's definitely a good name I, I mean i think trey benson's the best running back in the draft if you were to take one in the second round I'm, i agree with you if you re-sign pollard do you do you get benson in the second though? Though. That's yeah, I mean, I think it depends on how many years is the is the Pollard deal. Is it another one year contract? Let's is say it's two. Two, two years. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I still think I'd be interested there, but if not, I think you guys know I, I do like Audric Estime from Notre Dame. I think uh, mm-hmm. he's got the perfect size. He's well built, strong lower body, weaving style of runner. He's good with his jump cuts. Uh, I, I think he's a good player. And then to me, I'm a big fan of Jalen Wright from Tennessee. I just always keep coming back to him and Ray Davis, the running back from Kentucky. Yeah. But there's something about Jalen Wright that, you know, if you want to go in the third or fourth round for either of those guys, I think that they're going to excel at the next level, specifically Jalen Wright, who was in a split backfield there at Tennessee. I think he's got good vision. He is an explosive playmaker type of guy. I know maybe if you're looking at, okay, a compliment to Pollard, do you want maybe more of a physical bruising type of runner to Pollard, who is the burner type? Uh, and hopefully he gets that long speed back, being in more year removed after the injury. But I don't know. I, I just think that he's a guy that can catch the ball in the backfield. I like Jalen Wright quite a bit, 5'11", 210 out of Tennessee. I think another Another question to the same point is let's say that the Cowboys re-sign Tony Pollard on a one or two year deal does that give them a little bit more flexibility to take a guy like Jonathan Brooks who you might not have to begin the season so you can work in guys like Malik Davis Deuce Vaughn in the beginning of the year see what they can bring from, mm-hmm. from that perspective and then once you get to beginning of October you can really start to ramp up Brooks and see what he can do from from a complimentary standpoint with Pollard because we talked about on this show you, if, if you don't re-sign Pollard you need a back that can come in and play yeah. so you kind of write off Brooks from that from that perspective if, if, if you're able to re-sign Pollard though I think that gives you that flexibility of bringing in Brooks. I think that's a great point. It would make me feel much better about going yeah. for Jonathan Brooks because that could be a redshirt year. And, and yeah. the Cowboys will know their doctor did his surgery, so they'll know exactly. exactly kind of where he's looking at. That's a great fit. Jonathan Brooks, I mean, if it weren't for the injury, he might be my number one running back in the draft. I think him and Benson are one, too. The other name that I'll throw out there, if you just want in terms of pure compliment, kind of a bigger back next to Pollard would be Isaac Garendo, the running back from Louisville, yeah. who mm. we got to see here at the star. That like dude him. is yeah, we talked about him a little big, bit. subtle, uh, but 
I mean, he moves so well for his size at 6'1", 225. Bigger back, but he can also catch the ball in the backfield. A little bit of injury concerns there. Hamstring, and he's had a list frank injury as well. That same injury that Jordan uh, Lewis suffered a yeah. couple years ago. But um, a four-year guy at Wisconsin before transferring to Louisville. I think he's a guy that could be that third down type of guy. But also, he's got some legit speed. Like he does. Legit breakaway speed. He could be up back at the next level, I think, that could uh, surprise some people too. But I think he's a day three guy you can get a lot of value from. Agreed. Uh, I, maybe not the day three value that you're talking about, but I'm still I'm all over uh, Corum from Michigan. Blake I Corum. just think from a, even though he's got yeah. the, the the carries and the wear and the tear of going through Big Ten seasons and being the bell cow for the national championship Wolverines, uh, I still think he would be a fun compliment for Tony Pollard. And you're taking a, a, a chance on a guy who had production in college and is a completely different run style than what Tony Hot Pollard brings to the table. Sure. All right, let's play this game again, says Red on Twitter. He says, what would be your favorite same-school draft combo for the Dallas Cowboys? Any round, but just two players Ooh. coming from the same university. This is so easy for me. Jackson Powers Johnson and Bucky Irving. Oh, <laughs> oh the Oregon two Oregon kids. That's yeah, no, so easy for it. me. <laughs> Man. You love the Ducks, don't you? Uh, in this in this draft class, absolutely. There's been other draft classes, absolutely not. Dan Lanning, I think he's doing something there up, in, up in Eugene. You, you see what he was able to do as far as developing defensive talent whenever he was at or, or excuse me at Georgia. Um, defensive coordinator under Kirby Smart for a long period of time whenever they were starting that dynasty out there in Athens. And bringing that to Oregon, he brought a lot of personnel guys with him to Georgia that had those same kind of uh, philosophies and mindsets and they look for a specific type of player and that's that translates to the offensive side of the ball too they get mean nasty guys physical guys big prototype type bodies and they develop those guys at the next level so well so um, yeah I, I trust where Oregon's at right now uh, just for funsies which could really help this team a lot let's go with T Sweat and Jalen Ford from the University of Texas okay I think uh, you know if T Sweat if you could land him in the second round maybe go Jalen Ford in the third or the fourth uh, I I'd be into that. I mean, Jalen Ford's a player, senior bowl invite. We know he was out there, a lot of experience. We got to cover him there at Frisco Lone Star. I think T Sweat, we've talked about a lot. Yeah. I mean, he fits exactly what this team needs. They tried to get it with Mozzie Smith, but tough guy to move. I mean, heck, you could throw Byron Murphy in there as well. Yeah. But Jalen Ford's a guy that I think two years ago, in terms of coverage, maybe the tape a little bit better than this past year. But I, I think he's a guy that can run uh, with tight ends. You know, sometimes he'll struggle to shed and get off some of the bigger linemen consistently, but that's why you want to have that T-sweat in front of him, uh, some of those bigger bodies that really did a great job of keeping him clean. High motor, works towards the line of scrimmage, sure tackler, big fan of Jalen Ford out of Texas as well. Uh, I mean, Texas has some guys. We, we, we've had drafts where they have had nobody taken. Yeah. This year, you look at the University of Texas, and there are some players that you really, really like. I think something very interesting about Jalen Ford, too, he had an opportunity to come out as a junior, and yeah. he was getting day two type of uh, type of love at that point. He's like, hey, if you have a really good process, really good combine, you can go out there. You you could possibly be a third round pick yeah didn't have as great of a year this past season and that's not to say he didn't have a good year at all i mean he was a really big part of that defense that texas put together behind defensive coordinator pete Kwiatkowski, mm -hmm. and he was a big part of what they did from uh just being able to kind of be a traffic cop for the defense and manage everything and do what do what he does in the second level but i think there's still a lot of value you can get there because he's starting to slip to early day three and this mm -hmm. in this year's draft it's a little bit deeper at linebacker so yeah I, I think there's an, an opportunity to take a guy like a jalen ford in the fourth or fifth and get a really good value out of it. I wish I was just a little more sold on Van Pran out of Georgia. It's not yeah. like I don't like him, but I'm not in love with him because then I could pair him with Bullard, my safety, who I adore. Mm -hmm. See, I so initially I was going to make the joke of Michigan mm -hmm. just because of how that worked out in the past and everybody would just kind of make the joke. There are two good Michigan players that you that would help your football team. Junior Colson, the linebacker, and you've got Blake Corum, who we just mentioned it earlier. That would be a fun little double dip. Guys, Junior Colson. He's He's... He's nice. I think he's my number one line. He might he's be nice. up there. I have him as number four right now, mostly because I'm a, a coward. I need to move him up, though. I, I mean, it's he, because I don't want to put him above Peyton Wilson and Jeremiah Trotter Jr. Because I love right. those two guys. But Colson's a, a okay. fun watch. In, in fairness, all right, Peyton Wilson is my favorite linebacker. So, and right, and the only reason it. I've like kind of ta you know tapered off is because of the medical issues with him. It well, seems no like soon. <laughs> that's kind of all of that. But man, Junior Colson, and I get it. Like the, the, the there's the everything. phobia of the Michigan, but he's big, and you watch him in that college football playoff, and he is running around with a club on his hand against Alabama in the national championship game against Washington, and he is making every single tackle, and he can cover. 
over. He's a three down player, which is important. You need to look at that in today's game. Is he going to be on the field for two downs, yeah. or do you have to sub him out nickel and dime packages? No, you can leave Junior Colson out there. I've got a second round grade on him, but I do think he might be the best all around linebacker in the draft. I've got a second on him as well. It's like a late second right now. I think he's a legitimate player. The other one I was going to say though was your Georgia connection. Mm-hmm. Why not Amarius Mims okay. and Lad McConkley at the second level, the Ooh. wide receiver? Get a little, get a little funzo at the end of it, you know. McConkey is just McConkey, he, he is McConkey. he is so shifty. Uh, I mean, the, he played basketball as well in high school. A smaller guy, right? So you, you look at the catch radius; it's not quite there. But he is so quick; he wins immediately off the line of scrimmage. The natural separation, and you look at these next gen stats that come out. And CD Lamb, I think, ranked second in the entire NFL when it came to separation, which is a credit also to Mike McCarthy and some of the scheme and the design that they're doing offensively. Absolutely. But but Lad McConkey has just a natural ability to look, and he's got three to five yards. He's wide open. He dominates over the middle, feasts with those crossing routes, which you know the Cowboys really love. I mean, Mims, I said it last week, would it shock me if Amarius Mims we look up four years from now and he's the best tackle out of this class? No. He's got extreme talent. The question is, you look at 7A games started, but in those games where he played, he was playing in high leverage situations and was really, really good. But Lad McConkey is a fun player, and he can be a factor on special teams and the hands. I mean, he might have some of the best hands in the entire class. Yeah, I think something very interesting about the receiver position in regards to the Dallas Cowboys, going into free agency, you don't really have room right now to take a receiver in the top three rounds. Mm -hmm. I think there should be an emphasis going into free agency to be able to have that flexibility after free agency wraps up. Right. Yeah. Like you would love to be able to grab a receiver in the third round and not sure. feel like, oh, God, we really got to hit on this guy or else. You See, know, I'm looking at Mims first, pick, so. and I'm looking at McConkey in the third. That's kind okay. of my... McC- McConkey is not going to be there in the third. I've got him you in the second, too. I, don't think... I, think, I think he could be a late first. <sighs> he could be a late first or early, early second. Allen. Late one to early second. I would take him early second, but the late first, it would not surprise well, me. Well, it's interesting because a guy that got a ton of love after the senior bowl was... Was uh, Roman Wilson from Michigan? Yeah, I think Roman McConkey's Wilson. better than Wilson. I think both are really yeah. good, but I'd take McConkey over Wilson. Yeah, yeah. I, I think there's. I, I've talked about. I think I would put Wilson over McConkey because of the size. Yeah, I, I, I just Roman Wilson's a better blocker. In the size a little bit, and I do like what he can do on the outside. Definitely a better blocker. I think he's uh, catch radius and separation probably McConkey, but in terms of size advantage, give me give me Wilson all That's, day. Can't argue that. Yeah, I talked about in the third round that I feel like there's going to be a run of receivers. You look at guys like Brendan Rice, Roman Wilson, which I had an initial third before the senior bowl, probably need to go back and um, you know uh, adjust that. Jamari Thrash out of Louisville, Ricky Pearsall out of Florida, um, Malachi Corley out of Western Kentucky. I mean, these are all guys that you could look at in the third round and, and see a legitimate possibility. Jalen McMillan out of Washington. I mean, there's, there's a lot of talent I think you can find there in the third. Man, you take any one of those three Washington guys, you're That'd feeling pretty good. Yeah. Jalen yeah, Polk, you can throw in there too. He's really good. But I did love what you said about Corley. And Corley's another guy I don't think is getting past the second round. But yeah. that dude can ball. Yeah. And then you can throw in Malik Washington from Virginia, who we got to yeah. see here at the East West Shrine Bowl. And he's a guy that might he's be there really on day, at the top of day three. All right. Our guy Kofax says, what one player would you trade future picks to move up for in the first round? So we talked about the opposite in the first segment. It's more likely Dallas would trade back and accumulate trip picks than they would to go get a guy. Mm-hmm. But is there somebody that's up there that you're saying, I, I've got to have them? And you, you trade even your – maybe your 2025 20, picks to, to try and make it happen? I don't, I don't think so because um, I, 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 I don't think so because the tackle – uh, the tackle class is deep. I think you're going into the draft with four or five options there that you feel like could happen at 24. Mm-hmm. I feel like you at least get one of those to fall to 24, unless the team is just really dead set on getting a Jackson Powers Johnson type talent at center. They don't re-sign Biotish and they feel needy at that position. Mm-hmm. Then maybe you go ahead and jump up and grab them, but I don't think you jump up and grab anybody else from from that perspective. I think you 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 wait and see what offensive lineman falls to 24 if that's what you're set on doing. If you're between trading up and um, uh, sticking at 24, then that's that's probably what you do. Yeah, I'm probably not moving uh, just because I do like Graham Barton a lot. Now, maybe they don't. Right. Maybe they look at Jackson Powers Johnson. They say, you know, we're Barton, because of the medicals, whatever it is, we're not viewing him in that same area. Uh, they don't like Zach Frazier as much. They've got a big gap between JPJ and the next center. Then I do think it's worth it to move up a couple of spots and solidify the middle of your offensive line. Otherwise, man, I think you would just take one of these guys that you don't think are going to be there and they get close to your range. Like if it's an Olu 
Fashanu, the uh, offensive tackle from Penn State, falls, mm-hmm. who I think is an elite prospect. I'd maybe consider moving up to go get him. Uh, otherwise, I, I think you're going to stay put at 24. I think you're in a really, really good spot that you're going to have a good player on the board. I'm worried about Fashanu. Why? Without him, I, I, I don't love. He's what, maxed out. Yeah, I don't. I don't love what he brings from a um, a, a run blocking perspective. Really, um, I think. Uh, I think there's a couple of lapses in pass pro, but I think his pass pro is is where he's he's mm-hmm. strong at. Um, I'm a little. I'm a little concerned about Fashanu. There's not anything on tape that jumps out to me about Fashanu. You look at Joe Alt. You look at Talisi Fuaga. You see the the power, the athleticism, and not to say you don't see it with Fashanu too, but I think th- this might be one of those first round guys that has been on the first round board for a while and I don't know. I don't I don't love Fashanu. I just don't. See, I think he could end up him? being better I, than Joe Holt. I don't love Fashanu. <laughs> what do you have on him? I, I don't have anything on him right now, but I need to see him at Combine. Okay. I want to see how he works. I want to see him at Pro Day. I'm not giving like a final judgment on him, but I don't I would not take Fashanu right now. Really? I, I don't love Well Fashanu. I mean he's play, plays with two big old braces on his knees and he did get hurt his junior year. But I think his base I mean he did not allow a sack in three hundred and sixty five snaps in yeah. twelve games his senior season. Pass pros there. Don't the pass get me wrong. And, and and that's really I and I think he's good enough in the run game. I think he's got some nasty to him. Now he can get beat inside. That that's the way to get him. You can get him on the inside, but to me, I think it might be one of those tape studies like with Patrick Sertan, who came out out of Alabama a couple yeah. years ago, where people are like, he, he's just he's just clean. There's nothing you watch and you're like, this guy wows me. You watch the J.C. Horn and it's like, okay, he's a little bit more sexy Flashy. here. Yeah. I just think Olu Fashanu just gets the job done. And which one do you need in this organization? Somebody that just gets the job gets done. Gets the job done. Yeah, yeah. that's fair. I mean, I mean it just that's throwing fair. it out there. I like I like it. I really do because it, it not everybody sees the same prospects the same way. And uh, you could end up being right about them. I I hope you're not right about him. Me either. I never wish on anyone's downfall, <laughs> yeah. so I hope I'm wrong. Uh, okay. <laughs> well, you brought a, this yeah, up. Go bleep yourself over. That's, <laughs> such a lie. You, I hope you're wrong, too. You, <laughs> I'm a hater. You, you brought this up a little bit earlier, and uh, we got one more question here on Twitter on the 20, and this one says, could the Cowboys go offensive heavy in the draft and use free agency to fill the voids defensively? I, mean, I, I kind of want to modify the question a little bit. Do you feel like it's more likely they go defensive heavy in the draft or defensive heavy and free agency as opposed to going offensive heavy and free agency. Well, when I think about that and I think about possibilities, I think about the linebacker position. So, and I don't feel like you can, if you sign every linebacker you love in free agency, I still feel like you got to go draft one. So Mm -hmm. linebacker position, you're going to have to draft one Um, defensive tackle. Um, there's an opportunity to bring Hankins back, and if yeah. you if you bring back Jonathan Hankins, then um, you know there's not as necessarily a, 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 as big of a need to get another one in the draft, uh, especially early on. Yeah, now, this is a good defensive tackle class. If you want to take one mm-hmm. of those first couple days, man, you might be able to hit on one. But um, is it asking? Would that be a comfortable scenario? Basically, going heavy defense and free agency, and then focusing on offense in the draft. I think it's m- which one's more likely to happen. It's not necessarily a comfortability, what, but what would you believe is more comfortable for this team? Yeah, um, go, going offense heavy in the in the draft for sure. I yeah. mean that makes sense. You, you got to get an offensive lineman. Yep. Uh, in the first couple of rounds at least, um, you're hoping that you know there's a running back that gets taken pretty early as well. Wouldn't be surprised if there's a receiver on day three that gets taken. So yeah, you you would have to look at that for sure. I, I, yeah, I, I do think defense is the move in free agency because I think there's some tackles and some linebackers, but I agree. I don't think that that means, okay, if I fill this need in free agency, I'm not addressing it in the draft. At all, yeah. Uh, and I wonder with the, your new coach that you have is Mike Zimmer, and we've seen them in the past, whether it was Dan Quinn when he came in or whatever defensive coordinator is, they, they will – it seems like take some input of what are some guys you want here. So could that end up being, all right, we're going to be a little bit more defensive heavy in some areas? I think potentially. I think the first round for me is going to be an offensive player, and then there'll be a running back selected. The rest of the draft could definitely be defense, and that would not surprise me. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think there's a need for a receiver in day three? I think there is. Yeah, yeah I, I absolutely think they needed uh, a receiver in day three if they wanted to take a receiver earlier because I think there's going to be a run in the second round. If they looked at one of these second-round receivers and said, you know what, we need to take our guy here, 
year. We've got him graded. He's the best player available. I would not be upset with it. Uh, and I also think that we've talked about it. Corners a sneaky need for this football team. And then I yep. wonder about safeties. Mike Zimmer loves to do a lot with his safeties, puts a lot on their plate. We saw it with Harrison Smith uh, in Minnesota. And there are some safeties you watch in this draft class. We've mentioned several of them. Jaden Hicks last week. Uh, Javon Bullard, I think, could fill that. Cameron Kitchens uh, from Miami. Some of those guys that you look at and I think like, dang it, Mike Zimmer's probably going to really, really like this dude. So safety and corner, I think, are also two positions I wouldn't be surprised if they addressed as well. Day three receiver that I think would be the perfect fit for the Dallas Cowboys, Jordan Whittington out of Texas. Yeah. Uh, former five-star guy out of Cuero uh, down in Central Texas. Uh, won a state championship down there with them with the Gobblers. Uh, but he's physical and long speed. Um, he battled a lot of injuries his first few years in Austin, and I, I think that kind of stunted his development from a certain standpoint. And they kind of recruited around him or rec recruited over him. They brought in Xavier Worthy. Mm -hmm. They went in the portal and grabbed A.D. Mitchell. Those are two receivers that we see at the top of this draft. But I think Jordan Whittington, had he had the opportunity to be a feature receiver in this offense this past season, we would be talking about him in the same light. I really do believe that. Um, he's got legit speed with a, a big frame that he has. Super physical. He can make those contested catches. Uh, we saw him make a huge catch in that final drive that Texas had in that semifinal game yeah. that got them in position to potentially win it. Um, and I, I think where it becomes a really even more emphasized perfect fit for the Dallas Cowboys we see what happened last year whenever CJ Goodwin went down from a special teams perspective yeah I think Jordan Whittington is going to be a special teams demon at the next level yeah uh, from a gunner uh, as a gunner so uh, I think instead of Jalen Tolbert or Sam Williams that you're rolling out there you can trust Jordan Whittington to go out there he's a high IQ guy high character guy yes I think he'd be perfect for this team I, I think uh, you nailed uh, when it comes to Jordan Whittington the only issue is the the injury history right yeah, it is. he's a guy that's just struggled to but stay healthy a couple last couple of years but he did and, and, and I do yeah. think think uh, if you're looking at a guy that you want to hit and take a flyer on in the, in, on day three, he's certainly at the top of the list. There's no question about that. And I love the special teams versatility he brings as well. Yep. I mean, you go back and watch that state championship performance. No, we're not really yeah, necessarily yeah. go, but that is one of the best I've ever seen. <laughs> yeah, it was, it's probably, it's probably, yeah, probably the best state championship. Un number incredible. Two, Actually, number one is probably Jonathan Brooks, and then two is probably yeah. Jordan Winnington. Yeah. Welcome in the Friday Night Stars, everybody. Glad <laughs> yeah. you're with us. Uh, it, no, we're on the draft show, <laughs> finishing up here on Twitter on the 20. But when we come back, I want to talk a little bit about the safeties. You talked about okay. that as a sneaky need. We've hit safeties a couple times before, but could free agency possibly play a factor into that as well? And which safeties do you expect to show out in Indianapolis at the Combine? Who's going to light it up? When we come back, more of the draft show right after this. Hi, Drew Pearson, former Dallas Cowboy and now Pro Football Hall of Famer here. If you're struggling with your vision and tired of those contacts and glasses, don't throw a Hail Mary. Go where I went. Laser Care Eye Center, the official LASIK partner of the Dallas Cowboys. Drew, thank you so much for trusting us with your vision correction procedure. At Laser Care Eye Center, we offer six different vision correction procedures to help patients see. Check them out at dfwis.com. Tell them Drew sent you. Hood, hood. In a stressful world, Lincoln provides balance and calm amidst the chaos by creating sanctuaries that move you through the world with ease. Our vehicles make your time richer and more uplifting with human-centric design, intelligent technology, and powerful performance. As the official luxury vehicle of the Dallas Cowboys, driving a Lincoln is just another way to show your team pride. Experience our full lineup of luxury vehicles, including the Corsair, Aviator, Navigator, and Nautilus at Lincoln.com. I'm Dak Prescott, quarterback of the Dallas Cowboys. And they snap it to Prescott, who looks right. It's not there. He escapes left. He'll run for a first down. Just like football, when it comes to crypto, it's important to have a team you can trust. With Blockchain.com, I know I'm in good hands. Since 2011, they've been trusted by millions around the world to buy, sell, and trade cryptocurrency. Prescott's going to run this himself. Run it up the middle, and he scores. Whether you're new to crypto or an active trader, they've got you covered. What are you waiting for? Get started at blockchain.com. Hi, I'm Danny McRae, Dallas Cowboys alumni player here with Smoothie King. And Smoothie King wants to ask you, what's that sound? That's the sound of us magically transforming our smoothie bowls into two new decadent flavors. Dig into a cool acai or pitaya bowl, handcrafted with crunchy, purely Elizabeth granola, fresh strawberries, and finished with a velvety chocolate hazelnut drizzle. Perfect for breakfast, lunch, or any time you want to munch. And that's the sound of you making them disappear. Smoothie Bowls, now in two new decadent flavors. Only at Smoothie King, the official smoothie of the Dallas Cowboys. This is the DallasCowboys.com Draft Show. 
Back here on the Draft Show, wrapping things up here on this Tuesday, 65 days away from the NFL Draft in Detroit, Michigan. Back alongside Zach Wolchuk and Nick Harris. We've got Chris Beam in the back. We'll have Aisha Morrison and Bobby Belt on later in the week, but glad you're with us here on the Draft Show. We talked a little bit about this earlier. Zach, you said safety is sneaky need for this Cowboys team. J. Ron Curse is an, undraft, or an unrestricted free agent. There's lots of uh, question marks around the safety position now that Dan Quinn has taken the job in Washington. We've talked about some of these top-end safeties. Tyler Newbin from Minnesota, Cameron Kitchens from Miami, Kalen Bullock from USC, Javon Bullard from Georgia as, as potentials there. I want to know who's going to light it up from a team speed standpoint, from a a combine standpoint. Anybody jump off the page and what we can expect next week in Indy? I mean, I do think Bullock should run well. Yeah, that was my first guy too. Right, like Bullock should should be a guy now, I, and I think he's a corner. Like for me, I'm not yeah. I'm not a fan of Kalen Bullock at safety. He's just too darn skinny, and I don't think he tackles well. So I would Six feel foot three one ninety. Yeah, I'd feel very nervous about playing him <laughs> him in the back end. Or I mean, look, you can move him in. Maybe he can slide in uh, on, on nickel packages and play some corner. But I'd probably move him to the outside. I think he's a, a guy that could run in the four fours. My guy, Javon Bullard, who is a little bit of a shorter dude at 5'10", I think he could run really, really well. I'm excited to see Tyler Newbin, though. Tyler Newbin, I think, could make some money. If he ends up running sub 4'5", I think he's a dude that is going to end up maybe being the first safety off the board there from Minnesota. He's so, my number one safety, by the way. And I, I can see that, right? Because he's one of the most complete players that you've got at that position. Uh, those are some of the guys that I'm excited. And then, of course, there's Cooper DeJean from Iowa, who I do think is a corner, but some people might view as a safety. I think he could play either you saw him just be an absolute special team star there potential first round pick how does he end up testing as well uh there in indianapolis those are some some, some guys that i would kind of keep my eye on cooper DeJean. 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 i like dijon i think it adds a i did bit too i said it that way too i was like maybe he's not french though dijon just doesn't sound as good DeJean. yeah we're gonna have to have a talk with you cooper hey cooper <laughs> can we switch this to dijon dijon uh I, I know you love javon bullard and i do too i think he's a really good safety i think he's a guy that can okay. go Comfortably day two. Comfortably. I, thought you, I thought you were going to rip my dude a little bit. I don't think he's going to test well. You don't? I don't think he's going to test think, well. You don't think either. he'll run well? Good 40 time? Correct. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I don't think he's going to test well. So That's fine. Slide a little you. bit. I'm yeah. okay with yeah, that. was getting a little range. defensive there for a split second. We were about second. to find out about the cage match. <laughs> that, that, <laughs> uh, that's my one guy. I can't. I cannot take any slander on him. <laughs> I'm telling you, he's going to be a stud. I think he's good, though. I think he, I, I, there's some guys that have instincts that overcome a lack of athleticism or a lack of speed in other mm-hmm. areas. I'm trying to think one off the top of my head. I can't. Antoine Winfield Jr. There you go. Mm. Um, Javon Bullard feels like one of those guys that will just be able to carry on instincts and carry on his football knowledge and what he does from that defensive backfield. Love what he does. Here's kind of a later guy, I think, in, in to, um, in, comfortably into day three. Keaton Oladapo from Oregon State. He mm. was a senior okay. bowl guy. Um, really lengthy. I, that was the thing that kind of took me away. Um, and he's able to cover a lot of range as a result. And he he ran really well too, and being able to get to the ball and fly to the ball, um, he's he's a guy that affect affected the game at all three levels at Oregon State. He was getting sacks, tackles for loss, and then he was also getting interceptions and pass deflections on the back end. Uh, he's a guy that I love as a as a three level type of defender, and that's what you love to see from the safety position. And I know I've talked about it with Tyler Newman about how he can approach the running game and get into the backfield and identify sure. it so early on. I think Oladapo has those same type of instincts, but um, maybe a little bit more of a, a, a great aggressiveness from Oladapo that kind of allows him to throw himself out of the play at times so I think that's why you're probably looking at day three value there but if you're looking for a guy that could probably test pretty well I think Oladapo is going to be one of them and you're talking about these these later picks I don't know if this guy even is categorized as a later pick but I want to talk about him maybe maybe late day two Jalix Hunt from Houston Christian okay I what do you guys know about him? Six foot three, two hundred and fifty pounds. He played at Houston Christian, yep. so uh, he's not too far down the road. Is this somebody that is smaller school, smaller competition, but he's starting to gain some real momentum here since the Senior Bowl, since going into to combine time, got an invite. Is what are you looking for for him? Yeah, so Jalex Hunt, he he uh, was out of Florida um, and was initially a corner. Uh, coming out of um, coming out of high school, yeah. Houston Christian under their uh, head coach uh, Braxton Harris, um, he came over from Campbell. Really good developer as far as being able to identify guys that might be able to find some to- some sort of um, uh, positional change. So he went to Cornell uh, 
as a corner, uh, oddly enough, and then uh, went to Houston Christian and they beefed him up and put him on the edge. Added like forty pounds to his frame. He's six foot four. They're like, hey, we're gonna add some weight to your frame. We think you can be aggressive as a pass rusher. That's exactly what happened. And he went to Houston Christian in two seasons. Was really productive down there for the Huskies. Um, obviously not playing in the best of competition in the Southland, yeah. but I think there's an opportunity for him to be able to go to the combine, be able to kind of pair what he did at the Senior Bowl against some really good competition and make some things happen. He had some reps against Tyler Guyton out of Oklahoma yeah. at the Senior Bowl where he was really able to flash. He is athletic. He is violent. He's a guy that I found midway through the season last year, and I just kind of tracked as the year went on. He's a really fun guy that I think he won't be ready year one, but mm -hmm. I think once you get him developed, he could he could, he has a very high ceiling. 34-inch arms. 34-inch arms. The reason People I are going to love that. Everybody at home might be asking, why are we talking about an edge rusher in a safety segment? Because he played safety initially, and mm -hmm. that's not an intro, or like that's not an, a normal transition. You're not going at all. to play corner, like you said, corner at Cornell. Then he plays a little bit of safety. Now he's playing edge rusher. Like it's one of the more intriguing conversations of yeah. the entire draft. And is he going to play safety at the next level at six foot three, two hundred forty eight pounds? No, he's not playing safety. But will he will he rush off the edge and have some nimbleness to his game in doing so? Absolutely. So it's a fun think, er, thing to, to look at whenever you're talking about a guy who's making a sw position switch that's not normally seen at the next level. If, if the, any viewers are out there are more curious about diving into Jalex Hunt, go look at his game against Lamar on September 30th this past season. Okay. Good to know. Any other safeties that Dallas could be maybe looking at whenever you go into a, a day two, day three standpoint? Ooh, day two, day three for safety. I mean, I wonder about, you know, you, you've got some local guys from TCU, like Bud Clark is an interesting player. Uh, Akeem Dent from Florida State is another name that, that's interesting. Yeah, he, he's, he's a guy that I've liked. A couple of forced fumbles that I watched on tape from him. Uh, I think he's a good athlete, 6'1", 203. I wonder what he's going to run. And then uh, I, I know Bo Brady's been brought up. I think Aisha brought him up out of Maryland as well that could go day three. Tackling machine, you know, six passes that he broke up last year uh, a couple of interceptions as well I think Bo Brady's an intriguing prospect and then uh, Vaki the safety from Utah is another name that I've seen some people are, are really really high on as well that could go in that range tell me about him a little bit six foot 208 yeah and, and he might be a little bit shorter uh to, to what you're looking at but i think he's a guy that can go fourth fifth round two passes defended i think he had 50 tackles last uh last year a three passes broken up you know he he was a guy that i think he was out there for the senior bowl i don't know if you got to get eyes on him out there but i think he had a decent week of practice and, and when you were watching him in some individual drills he stood out to me and was like okay this guy can move a little pretty well uh and, and granted he's not the super tall guy like we talk about bullock from usc but vaki's a player that i think uh, versus the run could, could be could be strong there as a safety yeah whenever i was looking at utah safeties at the senior bowl cole bishop was the guy that i really oh enjoyed. yes cole bishop and Bucky's good but i i liked what cole yeah. bishop brought to the senior bishop's bowl. probably better and i i think um that's that's a fun late day two early day three value that you could look at yeah. six foot one 208 pounds and uh he, he's a game manager back there in the, uh, in the well and bishop also blitzes yeah. Uh, yeah i mean he's a guy that got some pressure on the quarterback Talk about too. A three level guy yeah that's, cole, that's cole bishop's overall a better player is there uh just from an overall standpoint, whenever you're looking at the safety class, is this a, a, a short-lived safety class? I mean, I, I feel like we're we're tossing around the same ten to twelve names that are going to be taken yeah. throughout the weekend. Yeah, I think you're probably deep. right. Do, doesn't it's not stretch, a deep class. but those the, but those players are good. I mean, sure. I, I, the top end of this thing, I think, is really really good. You're going to get some, but you're right. It does not stretch uh, like we talk about with receiver or some of these yeah. other spots. There you go. Yeah. Anything else? Anybody want to do any tell me more? What was the best player you watched this week, Nick? Oh my goodness. Gosh, that's a that's a tough one. Let me <laughs> let me let me break this okay, down. Can I give let you guys a, a player that I wasn't I'm ready when y'all are, but Ooh. go ahead. As as a big of a fan on as oh. some others are. Oh no. I mean, do you guys like Marshawn Neeland, the edge from Western Michigan? See, I liked him at Senior Bowl. And I, I went into Senior Bowl thinking, okay, the G5 guy. I, okay. I love seeing the G5 guys that are getting those day one, day two love. Okay, what are they doing to dominate at that level? I didn't see that from his film. I loved him at Senior Bowl. Okay. Yeah. So, and maybe he's a guy you get up close and personal with, and, and you're, but you watch the tape for me. 
I was expecting to jump out, and I wanted to see somebody that dominated against the Central Michigans when he played there. Because he's an edge out of Western Michigan, 6'3", 268. You know, I think he's one of those. He ran track in high school, all-conference high jumper as well. You know, his athleticism translate on, uh, translates on tape. He's quick off the ball, lots of hand fakes to set up linemen on his rush. The bull rush, he can push uh, tackles back into the lap of the quarterback. But to me, he's one of those guys where he kind of rushes himself out of running lanes a little bit, gets knocked on the ground, doesn't always set the edge when you want him to. I wasn't as high on Marshawn Neeland as uh, I was expecting to be after watching him, but maybe I need to you know, see how he tests in, in interviews and some of these you know, individual workouts as well with some teams. Maybe he ends up raising his stock a little bit. You know, it's funny. You, you, you mentioned the Senior Bowl specifically, and there were times in those practices where he was shedding blocks. Mm-hmm. That's not what he did on his film. No. He, he struggled to get off of blocks in his film, and then whenever you got him to the Senior Bowl, and let's say the game – at that point, you're trying to make money as a small school guy, like you said. You're going with uh, an added emphasis of, hey, they say you can't shed blocks, you got to shed blocks. Can he do that in game time right. action at the NFL level? I, I kind of I have a little bit of pause on that, but the way that he was able to do it at the Senior Bowl shows that it's possible. And he it's looks small. I mean, he's a guy that I think is going to need to get a little bit stronger. He's not very long. No. He doesn't have a ton of length. There's some traits there. Uh, you look at the quickness, but not as high on him as I think others are. Interesting. Yeah, here's a guy that I really enjoyed out of the Senior Bowl and w- was able to watch more over over the course of the last week. And I, I think I may have mentioned him on the show already, but I want to dive into him a little bit more. Jamari Thrash, receiver out of Louisville. Um, man, if he's almost an exact proto uh, prototype of Jalen Tolbert. Like mm. They have very, very similar traits. Um, it, he's not the tallest guy in the world, but he can still go up and grab it. He's really decisive in his route running. He can make some things happen in the short to intermediate game. Um, he was a transfer out of Georgia State and was really productive for uh, a Georgia State in his junior season. He was an uh, All-American honorable mention uh, coming out of his junior year. Transferred to, uh, transferred to Louisville and still had an 850-plus yard season. Was really good with the Cardinals that was a really good offense this past year and he was one of the feature uh, weapons in that offense uh, shined at the senior bowl he's physical and route running he made DB's guess that's what I put as the notes as far as coming out of his uh, performance in Mobile I think he's a third round guy comfortably that could really shine I think in, a, in the right system get him in a system where the offense is really spread out they get a lot of things going west coast type of system and I think he could really he could really thrive at the next level thriving thrash no, uh, thriving thrash. Maybe that'll like be the that. title of the show. Thank well, you. Yeah. <laughs> Put him as a thumbnail, and that'll there be the, the end of it all. Cool. All right. Well, that does it for us here on the draft show. We'll be back on Thursday, 11 a.m. Central Time, to break it all down for you and keep you rolling. Uh, we're going to do some mock drafts on Thursday. We're going to do some scenario-driven mock drafts. Sweet. Right. Yes. That, that was the plan. Yes. It, it, we're going to yeah. put together some free agency. You sound very doubtful. A mock free agency and that see how that changes things for the Cowboys okay. to yeah. move forward. All right. That's what we're doing Thursday. So we got a lot to look forward to. And hopefully we'll have Aisha and Bobby back in the fold as well. Brian on vacation this week, and then he's going to be in uh, surprise. surprise. Yeah, we're going to have to surprise Arizona for spring training next week. So won't see Brian for a little bit, but guess what? You're covered. We got you going we for do. for the next couple weeks, and then he'll be back for the draft show right after spring training. After that, so mm-hmm. that's the plan for the draft show moving forward. For Chris Beam, Nick Harris, Zach Wolchuk, I'm Kyle Yeoman saying so long. We'll see you next week with more of the draft show presented by Miller Lite. This has been a production of DallasCowboys.com and the Dallas Cowboys Football Club. How about this, Cowboys? Yeah!